So Josh is standing between you and lunch, um, but this is one of the coolest sessions uh, that you're going to see today. So, well, they're all cool, but Josh is in particular. So I'd like to introduce Josh Rotsman. Take it away. Hey, um, so I'm Josh Watsman. I'm going to be talking about the actual technical process of how you convert a PHP code base into a hack code base and what that looks like. Um, although I'm giving the presentation, um, a lot of the actual technical, technical details here were worked out by my coworker, Gabe Levi. Um, he's here as well, sitting over here, um, so you can talk to either of us um, afterwards about anything about conversion. There should be some time for Q&A after the presentation as well. Um, both Gabe and I come from the product world at Facebook. We did not originally start in infra. I myself worked on Newsfeed for two years and was really compelled by how awesome Hack was and how much it was improving the lives of product developers on Newsfeed. Um, and in particular, the conversion process as well as what it could do to open source Hack. And so I'm really excited to be here talking about the conversion after we have open source Hack for all of you guys to try this now. The process I'm going to be describing, it's worth noting, is what we did at Facebook and what worked well for us. But there may be adjustments that make more sense for your project. This is not the be-all and end-all. This is not the canonical way of doing a conversion. This is one way of doing a conversion that worked well for us. So here is the general process for how we think about doing this conversion. It happens in two major steps. The first one is to take an um, standard PHP code base and to try and just make as much of it visible to the type checker as possible. Just get HH at the top of those files. We're still going to be missing, going to be missing type annotations, and we can add a bunch of those in the second step. Go ahead and add missing type annotations. Um, automatically, we can infer them in a bunch of places. And then we have a partially typed hack code base, and we can go and manually fix um, and, and add in the rest of those type annotations. So what does this first step look like? How do we go from PHP to untyped hack? Um, and the answer to that is we have a very, very simple tool called the Hackificator that does this for us. And here's an example of what the Hackificator might do. The code on the left is valid PHP code. As it turns out, the code is also valid hack code. And so the Hackificator will see that and translate it. Um, we'll, we'll change the header and make it the file on the right. The Hackificator does this file by file, and it'll try each of the hack modes in turn. It'll first go with strict mode, then partial mode, then decal mode, and if the conversion doesn't succeed um, in any of those modes, um, it'll stick with PHP. Um, just as a refresher, Julian talked about the different modes. Um, but um, it, just to describe them again, strict mode requires everything be annotated, and there's no inter interoperability with PHP. It's very strict. Partial mode allows interoperability with PHP and doesn't require annotations everywhere. That's probably where most of your code is going to end up, such as this. And decal mode doesn't type check the bodies. It just checks the interfaces. So this is an example of what the Hackificator might do to convert this file into, into partial mode. Here's an example of a file that doesn't convert cleanly into partial mode. It's valid PHP on the left, um, but it turns out that hack requires that um, all member variables be declared and defined. PHP doesn't. So although this is legal PHP, it's not legal hack partial, and we'll leave this in decal mode, where we skip type checking the body and won't notice uh, and won't care that the member isn't defined. The hack of the cater, along with changing the headers, will make a couple of other small syntactic tweaks. Um, here's one of them. Um, it will add a nullable annotation on the type if you gave a null default value. This is how PHP indicates that a type will be nullable on the left. Hack has a specific nullable type on the right, and we'll add that for you. We'll also supply a missing constructor argument list. If you don't have one, hack enforces we have argument lists all over the place for consistency. Um, so we'll go ahead and make all these syntactic tweaks. What I've described, these three things, is all the Hackificator does. It changes the headers, adds nullable type annotations, or add, make a type annotation nullable if it's clear that's what you meant, and it adds an empty constructor argument list if it's clear that's what you meant. That's it. It's a very, very simple tool, um, but that also means that you can sort of run it on all of your code base all at once. And that's basically what we did here. The y-axis on this graph is the fraction of files at Facebook with HH at the top. Um, you can see that we started, um, when we started tracking these stats, at about 10% uh, hack. And then there are a couple of small steps here, which is where we were testing out the Hackificator. We were sitting with the teams whose code we were converting, literally sitting next to them, making sure that everything was going OK, being sort of high service, 
to, to make sure they weren't running into any issues. Getting that social buy-in with these teams, making sure they were happy before we did it with everyone at Facebook. And that's what these gigantic steps here are here. Literally overnight, over the course of two weekends, we converted the rest of our code to hack and went from, what is this, about 35% to 96% over the course of a couple weeks. Just go through everything. The hackificator takes about overnight to run. Um, the, the type checker only takes about 100 milliseconds for a given file. However, whenever you have thousands of files times potentially um, three or four conversions per each file to go through each of the modes, the time does add up. So it takes about overnight for us. Your project is probably much smaller than that. And so you probably won't have any problems. This is not just like a quick five second thing. I'm just noting um, it, it can take a, a tiny bit of time. Now I'm going to go into one important detail of the way the hackificator converts your code um, that wasn't apparent to us when we did this conversion, but it turned out to be really important. So let's take a look at this project here. Um, this is a typical PHP project. It has four files in it, a superclass work item, along with three subclasses, first, second, and third work item. We're starting all in PHP, so we have four PHP files. First work item and second work item have the problems that I described earlier. They are using an undeclared member variable. And so they're not going to convert cleanly into hack partial because they have this undeclared member variable. Um, third work item and work item itself have no problems. And so the question becomes, how do you convert these four files? What does that conversion look like? Here's the way that may be obvious to do the conversion. We've converted the entire inheritance hierarchy of a work item and third work item um, because they have no problems. First and second work item are the ones that sort of morally have the, the error as far as hack is concerned, and so those go into deco mode. This is a perfectly valid way to convert these four files, and this is sort of intuitively the way that you might do it, and the way that maybe might make more, most sense to you just, just sitting here right now. However, it turns out this is not the only way to convert these four files. In order to describe what the other way is, I'm going to take a brief detour in describing a detail of how exactly the interoperability between hack and PHP code works. So let's put this aside for a second and consider um, th this code. Let's suppose that we have, again, a large project that's all PHP, except for this one file that is hack. Hack and PHP interoperate perfectly, seamlessly, so this class bar is allowed to extend foo, even though foo is defined in a PHP file, completely legal. But the question then becomes, how do we type check bar, given that we can't see foo, because foo is defined in a PHP file? The type checker only sees things that are in hack files. So what happens? Well, we have a function g that's defined to take an int, and we're passing in a string here. So that's a clear type error. We can see the function g, we can see the call site to g, and we can say that is wrong. So we'll error on the first line. What about the second line, though? The function f isn't defined in bar, but it might be defined in foo. We don't know whether it is or not. We can't see that. So in the general principle of hack, if there's something that we can't determine if it's right or, right or wrong, we assume that the programmer knows what they're doing and assume that it's right. So we won't do make any error on this arrow f. We assume that it must be correct because we can't see foo, even if f isn't actually defined in foo, because we can't tell. This means that if you have a PHP superclass anywhere in your inheritance hierarchy, we can't check for the usage of undefined method calls and undefined member variables. So that brings me back to my earlier example. This is the other way we can convert these four files. This is also legal as far as the type checker is concerned. First, second, and third work item all moved into partial mode, but work item itself is left in PHP. This is legal as far as the type checker is concerned because it can't know that foo doesn't actually exist in work item because it can't see work item. So it assumes that it must be defined even when it isn't, as we can see here. This approach is what we call the breadth approach because in this example, we have three files in partial and one in PHP as opposed to my earlier example, which has two in partial and two in decal. Decal doesn't do very many checks, so we're strictly checking more things here with this approach than we were with the other example. However, you may have a false sense of security because some of those checks aren't quite as strong as you might, thought, might have thought they would have been. This is just something to be aware of for your project. Whether in a given inheritance hierarchy, it makes sense to have the increased coverage, the breadth as I'm showing here, or the decreased coverage, but with stronger coverage up the inheritance hierarchy, the depth approach that I showed first. 
this example is particularly relevant to Facebook because this, this work item wasn't chosen arbitrarily. We have a superclass called Preparable that's, that's equivalent to this work item that has over 10,000 recursive subclasses. And so the fact that Preparable is in a PHP file means that these tens of thousands of subclasses aren't actually having the strong checking that we thought that they were or that sort of you might expect them to have. And furthermore, actually getting them that check means converting Preparable which, as you can see in this example here, if I convert work item even over to decal mode, suddenly I have errors in first work item and second work item and any other subclasses whose errors were masked by having a PHP superclass. And so converting from one to the other can be a little bit painful. Again, both might make sense for, for your given project. It's just something to be very aware of um, because this snuck up on us and we, we didn't really realize until it was, until it was too late um, what had happened. The most important detail is the hackificator is basically going to always give a breadth conversion which I'll demonstrate in just a moment, because it's going to encounter first work item and convert it to decal mode before it encounters work item. And so let me go to a demo so I can actually show you what happens here and show off the hackificator. Um, so the demo that I'm going to give is actually already posted on GitHub if anyone wants to follow along. Um, the script for the demo as well as a vagrant setup in order to generate the VM that I'm using is on hhvm slash hack conversion demo on GitHub. So first of all, um, I'm inside a web root with a bunch of files including these work items and some other stuff that I'll talk about later. Um, as Julian showed, we can run HH client. Um, it'll start up the server. Um, and in just a moment, the server will report there are no errors. Um, and we have this fast response time. Hack was designed to be a zero error system because errors are inconsisten inconsistencies in your code, as well as errors can cascade and mask other errors. So the, these, all, these conversion tools were all designed to start with a zero error trunk and give you a zero error trunk when they're done. So we're starting with zero errors. Let's look at these work items. I have my work items in this, in this uh, directory. Here's the work item superclass. Oops. Uh, here's first work item. Third work item, uh, second work item is the same as first. This is the example that I just had up on the, on the screen on the slides. Um, now let's run the hackificator and see what it does to convert this directory. The hackificator binaries ship as part of our Debian and Ubuntu packages. Um, so you already have them if you're using those packages. Um, otherwise, there are directions inside the uh, HHVM wiki on how to build them. So let's run the hackificator on this directory. It's going to spit a bunch of stuff out. So let's go through this. It's going to first start trying to convert first work item into strict mode. Strict mode isn't going to work. Um, and here's the error, unbound name work item. Strict mode doesn't interoperate with PHP, so the work item superclass of first work item isn't visible yet. It's still in a PHP file, so this fails. Now, first work item is converted into, dec into, excuse me, into partial mode, because in isolation, first work item is legal in partial mode because we can't see the superclass, and so assume foo must exist. So that, that succeeded. So we're moving on to second work item, which fails in strict, succeeds in partial again. Third work item fails in strict, succeeds in partial. But then we get to the work item superclass. And we get this error now. Once work item is converted, whether you're in strict, partial, or decal, we have the same error. The member foo is undefined in first work item. This is because we can now see the entire inheritance hierarchy and see that we were actually wrong in the first place, that foo doesn't exist. And so in this way, we, we have the breadth conversion that I showed off a moment ago. So work item is still in a PHP class. But first work item, second work item, and third work item are all in partial mode with just the HH at the top. And so here's the git diff. So this might not be what you want. Let's say you want the depth approach. Let's go back. And so the way to do that is to force the hackificator to do things in a certain order by just manually converting work item yourself. So I converted work item. Work item is now in partial mode because I know I want a depth approach. I want work item itself to be checked. So I converted this. Here's work item. No errors. Run the hackificator. First work item, when I convert into strict, um, I get the undefined member error. error. Same in partial. First work item converts successfully into decal. Second work item converts successfully into decal similarly. Third work item um, doesn't work in strict because it isn't fully annotated yet. But third work item um, does work correctly in uh, partial mode. So we can see that now. 
first work item and second work item are in decal, third is in partial, and the superclass is in partial. And so this is the depth approach. This is how you get a depth conversion. And so you'll commit that, you've converted this directory, um, and then you can commit that into your trunk. So we can go back to the slides. So that was the first half. How we go from a PHP code base into an untyped hack code base. Um, and the answer to that is the hackificator, which will do the conversion for you. How do we now get from an untyped hack code base and add type annotations so that the type checker can start making um, deeper checks in your code base? Um, more importantly, when we're inferring and adding type annotations, how do we do it without taking down the site? A type mismatch in PHP and in hack is an irrecoverable error by default, and it will stop your request. So how do you add these when they might potentially be incorrect without, without breaking things? And here's the, uh, here's the solution we developed for this. You do it in two steps. The first one is to go ahead and add a bunch of types that might be wrong. But do it in such a way that instead of failing at runtime and with a hard failure, they give you a warning message that you can print into your production logs. Then the second step is to read your production logs and remove the types that are actually failing at runtime. Then you can make the others back into hard failures, and now you have a fully converted code base, or at least a code base as converters or automatic tools can do. So let's talk about the first step. How do we do that? So in my examples here, I'm going to be using the HH client dash dash color mode that Julian was showing earlier. Um, so I'm alighting syntax highlighting in favor of showing what is and isn't checked as we add more type annotations. So let's start with this example um, with no type annotations. It's a hack file, but no type annotations. So you can see most of this is red. We're not actually checking much. We're missing parameter and return types left and right. So how are we going to infer what's actually going on here, what, what those types should be? What HH server dash dash convert is going to do is it's going to go ahead and statically type check your code. All of this that I'm going to describe is this is all static. We're going to go ahead and type check your code. We're not going to do much because of all this red stuff. But while we're doing that, we're going to go ahead and record the types that are flowing in and out of the function as we're doing type checking, all the return statements and the function calls. So for example, the function f, we're going to see two return statements and we're going to record both of those types. We're going to record foo and we're going to record null. In g, when we're checking g, we're going to see two calls to f and we can see both of those are integers, so we're going to record int and int for the parameter to f. We see the return statement in g, we're not actually going to record anything for that because we don't know what f returns yet. There's no annotation yet. Then when we get to h, we're going to record two calls to g, string, and int. After we're done checking and have all these records, we're going to go through and try and find a suitable supertype of all of the list of recorded types. So for example, right here, a suitable supertype of int and int is, of course, int. And so we'll go ahead and add that as the type annotation for the parameter $x to the function f. A suitable supertype of foo and null is nullable foo. So we're going to add that type annotation. And so here's what it looks like after one step. We've added these annotations as well as the void return type to h. And so we're checking more things now. But even more importantly, we can make another pass. Because here, now we know what f is returning. It's returning nullable foo. And we can go ahead and add that in another pass. And we can keep making more passes and keep propagating types forward until we've added nothing else. As you can see here, um, these types are all prefixed with an at sign. We're using, um, we've added, um, made an addition to PHP's error suppression mechanism so that these type annotations log an E warning instead of failing hard with an E recoverable error at runtime, meaning that they're safe to add and safe to put in production code and so that we can um, look at the production logs to make sure they're correct. So I've demonstrated running this on one file. But it turns out you actually probably want to run it on all of your code base all at once, even though it can actually run directory by directory. Um, and here's why. Let's suppose we have a large hack project, lots of hack files, and we're adding type annotations. But we run it on a directory with just this one file in it. So what's going to happen? We're going to record the type int as the parameter to f. That's the only thing we see. And so we're going to try and add an int type annotation there. But it turns out, let's say this is sitting in a different directory int isn't the right type here. It should have been nullable int. And in fact, we would have been able to figure that out if we'd seen this code. We could have found that super type. But because you only ran it on a directory with this file in it, we didn't. We added an annotation that didn't even type check and immediately reverted it. 
So you should run it on as much of your code as possible at once in order to get this bigger visibility and add the better types. Um, you don't have to commit it all at once. You can commit it directory by directory. You just want to run it all at once so that it can do this global inference. Um, at Facebook, we have tens of millions of lines of code. This took about overnight, again, to run. Um, your system is probably much, much smaller than ours, so you can afford to run it on all of, should be able to afford um, to run it on all of your code at once. It, it scales pretty well. So now we've added these types. Um, what's the next step? The next step is to parse your production logs and remove the ones that don't match. We've provided a tool that will actually parse the log for you, assuming your error handler doesn't change the log format too much. We ship another binary alongside the hackificator called hack remove soft types. It has an option called dash dash delete from log, which I'll show in a moment, that parse, parses your production log and goes through and removes all the types that failed at runtime. You can then commit that removal diff, push it to production, and keep iterating on this until no more types are failing at runtime. Then you can go to the next step and harden all the types. Remove the at signs. Now everything is a hard failure at runtime, and you've converted your code base to hack and edit these type annotations. Um, and now I'm going to go to a demo and show how this works. OK, so I was playing with the work items. Um, let's go to a different directory. I've got a couple files in here, good and bad.php. So first of all, let's talk about uh, good.php. This is the example um, that I gave a minute ago um, of adding type annotations with a couple of echo statements added, just so that when I execute this code, um, you, can, you can see that something is going on. I also have a file um, bad.php. I've already converted this file to hack and added a couple of type annotations. But the type annotations are actually going to fail at runtime. They pass the type checker. No errors. But these annotations are wrong. And the type checker can't see that because of the missing annotation on this parameter to G1 here. The type checker doesn't see that this is actually a string. Well, it sees that this is a string. But it loses the type due to this missing annotation here. And so it can't see that a string is actually flowing through here to this integer annotation here. So this is going to fail at runtime when I run it. So let's convert this directory and see what happens. First, let's run the hackificator. Um, bad.php is already in hack. Good.php wasn't. Um, it, it doesn't work in strict mode for a bunch of reasons. Um, but it, it converts cleanly into partial. Now, um, let's see what it looks like to add the type annotations to this directory. And the way you do that is hh server dash dash convert, then the directory to convert. which is this directory that I want to convert. And then you also need to give it the root to your project so that it can ensure that the types that it adds are all consistent. And so I said a moment ago you should run it on your entire project, but for the purposes of this demo, I'm running it on this one directory. So it's going to add a bunch of types. There's a bunch of log spew that you can look through later if you want. I won't go through it. It's not terribly important. Um, but the interesting thing is that good.php now has the types added to it that I demonstrated on my earlier slide. We went ahead and inferred all of this. And now, if I go ahead and color good.php, we can see that everything is green now, except for the parameter $y that we couldn't infer a type for. Because string and int, there isn't really a good super type um, to, to put from here. I think, think I forgot to mention that a moment ago. So we've converted this. Um, so, so we can commit this, push it to production. And now we can run this code to see if these type annotations actually work at runtime. So let's um, tail our production error logs. Let's see, where is this? Um, so here's my error log. Now, um, let's open up good.php. All the types were correct. We print a bunch of stuff, um, but nothing in our error logs over here. But if I open bad.php, I get a couple of warnings. Not errors, warnings. Argument doesn't match, return type doesn't match. So now we, we have these logs in production. How do we fix these bad types? We can remove them. Uh, our tool for that is hack remove soft types, dash dash delete from log, and I can directly pass it my error log. It'll parse the locations and the paths and everything out of the error log, and we'll delete everything for you. So if I do a 
cat of bad.php, the types are gone now. The ones that didn't work are gone now. So I can commit this, push it out, go back to production. Um, this in production, I'm now, uh, I can retail my error logs. No more errors. Bad types are removed. At this point, both bad.php and good.php have no errors. Presumably, I'm in production and verifying that everything is clean across everything in production. So I can now remove all the at signs. Hack remove soft types. Dash dash harden is the option for this. And I can harden good.php. All the at signs are gone now. I can commit this. Now we have fully converted this directory, and this is how you convert your code to hack. Um, I have a couple more slides, so we can switch back. So this is what the conversion looks like at Facebook. Uh, the y-axis here is fraction from 0 to 1 of places in the Facebook.com uh, code base, places that could have annotations that do have annotations. Um, so you can see we're up to about 40% of our code, um, places that could have annotations do having them. Um, we started at about 5% like a year ago. Um, a couple of these big step functions, in particular this one and some of these in here, was, is what this looks like when Facebook, um, when, when we started uh, running this tool across our code base and converting a couple of big directories. It's worth noting that we're not done yet. Um, this graph isn't at 100%. But equally important to note about this graph and for your conversion effort is that the few percent that I got from running this conversion tool, what that actually did was kickstart an organic conversion that you can really see taking off here. This growth wasn't us doing automatic conversions. It was entirely organic. So the most important thing about these tools is the Hackificator gets hack in front of your developers. It makes them think about hack, that they can start using all the cool features of hack, the type system, the short lambda syntax, everything. Then this starts kickstarting a bunch of type annotations, and so your engineers can start propagating those forward for you and m driving the conversion forward. Um, and, and that's where you're really going to get your growth. That's where a lot of the conversion is going to come from, from the tools kickstarting an organic conversion. Um, that's all I've got. We have about three minutes left for Q&A, if anyone has any questions. All right, awesome. We have one over there on the right. Hey, uh, you brought up earlier that the type checker does not see any PHP files, but only hack files. Correct. So it seems to me like a lot of this is based on the assumption that you have a huge monolithic code base, such as Facebook. Mm -hmm. While the reality, I think, in most PHP projects these days, luckily, is that you use a lot of third-party libraries. Yes. Now, you are not going to be the one to convert those third-party libraries exactly. to hack. Um, so why is it, or what is the reasoning behind not using the information about types that you can still get out of PHP files in order to convert your own project to hack? So yeah. you could look at calls made inside of the PHP code to infer types for your own classes. Mm -hmm. You could uh, use the type annotations that are well, well, the type hints in PHP. Yes. So, um, so there's a, there's a couple of reasons, a couple a couple, couple things I can say here. Um, the first one is that we need a better story around interoperability with PHP and, and dealing with stuff like this. Um, we have some ideas. Um, in particular, you know, someone like Laravel or Symfony is not going to convert to hack in the near-term future. Um, they just can't afford the backwards compatibility loss. And so we need a way to better interoperate with them. And we don't have a good story around that right now. And that's something we're thinking about. Um, to actually specifically answer your question, why don't we parse PHP and use that that inheritance information, and so we can pull method, at least method definitions and so forth out. Um, the answer to that is that a lot of code might define this dynamically. Um, in my example, where foo inherited from bar, there's nothing that says that bar has to actually be a class on disk. It could have been a class evaled into existence or something else weird that you did, and we have to support that because we interoperate with PHP. Um, in a lot of cases where bar, bar probably is a file on disk, and in a lot of those cases, we're, we're looking towards maybe doing something better there. Um, but even something as simple as like a conditional declaration of bar, right? That's something that we really can't statically analyze. Maybe you define bar one way if um, this feature exists in PHP 5.2, and a different way if it, this extension exists in 5.4. People do lots and lots of that stuff, and that's stuff that just isn't going to necessarily type check well. And so that's why, at least right now, we don't have a, a good way to do that.
Other questions? Do you have support now for like some kind of pure functional ideas like map, reduce, and partition, and whatnot, or do you have plans to support that? Um, yes, and I will let uh, Drew talk about collections, which is sort of the Im important use case there. Um, but the short answer is yes. After lunch. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Josh.